I started working at 13. My first job was the paper boy for my local hometown newspaper, The Liberal. I was raised in a small suburb of Toronto, Canada, and being the paper boy was hard work. I'd wake up before class, I'd load up my bike, and I'd go deliver the paper. But there were some highlights. Every month, I would knock on the door of my customers, they'd tell me what they thought of my product, and then I would ask them, can you please renew your subscription? Times have certainly changed, haven't they? Subscription services today have it so easy. You get someone to sign up, you take their credit card, auto renewal does the magic. No more knocking on doors. While many things have changed, some things haven't. In fact, I use that analogy and I use that thought experiment for all my product managers working on subscriptions. If you had to knock on the door of your customer to get a renewal, what would they say? Would they be excited? Would they happily give you their money or not? So today, I'm gonna to walk you through subscription mastery for product managers. My name is AJ Aurora, as Christine mentioned. I'm the Senior Vice President of Product and Engineering at Disney. If you count my time as a paper boy, I've been in subscriptions for 30 years. But let's not count that for now. If you don't count that, I've been in subscriptions for 15. I started off leading product management for Amazon's digital audiobook subscription service, Audible. I spent time in Netflix, where I worked on growth and monetization for their growing business. And then most recently, I'm here at Disney, where my teams run engineering and product for commerce, growth, and identity. And we support our growing streaming services, Disney+, Plus, Hulu, and ESPN. On the side, for the past five years, I've been trying to distill all this knowledge around subscriptions. I teach a class at Stanford called Building and Scaling Subscription Services. And that's given me an opportunity to talk to more subscription professionals. In fact, over a thousand subscription professionals. And so I'm gonna take all this knowledge and distill it and share it with you today. <clears throat> but first, let's warm up the crowd. I want you to get to know your neighbor. So go talk to your neighbor. And I have just one single question. I want you to ask your neighbor what services you're subscribed to and what's your favorite subscription. If you run out of time, focus on the second question first, maybe. All right, I'll check in in about a minute or so. All right, let's bring it back, let's bring it back, let's bring it back. All right. <clears throat> All right, on the count of three, count of three, I want you to scream back your favorite subscription. Three, two, one. Okay, I got that, I got that. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, when we go to dinner parties, this is the question I ask people. I've asked this question thousands of times, and so I have a good sense of what people typically say and these brands typically come up. Is one of your favorite subscriptions on this page? Okay, very good, okay, good, I know my audience. Um, so, 
we're going to talk about these companies and why is it that so many people love these subscription services. And so before we dive in, I really want to say that now is the most exciting time to be in the world of subscriptions, right? We have so many great companies that have paved the way. We have companies like Apple, which recently reported that they have over 1 billion paid subscriptions on their platform. And every one of these companies has over 100 million paying members. In fact, back in the good old days, if you had a million or so subscribers, that was a badge of honor. Now it seems that every quarter, some of these services are posting millions of subscribers per quarter. It's a great time to be in this space. And if I was to choose an image that represents subscription services, I come back to this infinity symbol. There's actually two reasons. The first one, that as a product manager, you're so deeply involved, and when you add value and you make the product better, it actually benefits the customer. The customers have deeper engagement, deeper retention. This deeper retention drives recurring revenue, which you can invest back in the business, and it's a beautiful flywheel. That's one aspect. The second aspect is that when you're adding value to these customers, you're always continuously focusing on driving new features, new innovation. And here's what I mean. One of the most common questions I get asked is, AJ, I've got a business, and I want to convert it into a subscription. Can I do it? And my response back is, yes, provided you do these few things. Number one, are you committed to invest in the product and make it better and better over time? If you're in the content space, are you going to continue to invest in new content types and content investment so your customers are always watching something new or listening to something better? And finally, are you going to be thinking about how to age with your customer? As things change, will they have tiers to upgrade or downgrade or different price plans as things change for them? So if you can answer yes to those questions, a subscription is for you. So aligning customer needs and delivering continuous value. So I'd like to tell stories, and I've decided to tell you three stories to take away the key insights for subscriptions. The first one's called being at the intersection. I get this question a lot, which is, what is a subscription, and how is it different than a membership? So let me tackle that head on. So a subscription is a business model. It's a business model where consumers pay a recurring price at regular intervals for access to a product or service. I noticed that none of you mentioned your insurance policy, right? Yet, that is a subscription. So now let's talk about memberships. So memberships are relationships. You guys can all name countless memberships you're part of. Think about your alumni association. Think about your loyalty program with your airline. Those are all memberships. Those are relations. So now we take this concept of a membership, you know, which drives this emotion, and we've got the subscription, which is a utility. And guess what? I'm going to drop my favorite chart, Venn diagrams. Who loves Venn, di Venn diagrams? OK, good, good, good. OK, so keep with me. Membership drives emotion. Subscription drives utility. What's in that sweet center? That's the magic. That's the magic. The best subscription services are building emotional utilities. I want you to think about that for a second and think about your favorite subscription. So don't just take my word for it, though. So we've got this concept, and here are some of the companies I heard you guys yell out. Spotify, Amazon Prime, T-Mobile, Costco. And I remember when I asked one of my students to name their favorite subscription, and they said, Spotify. I asked why, and they said, well, you know, Spotify has all the music I'm interested in. But you know what, AJ? Spotify actually knows me better than my spouse. You see, Spotify knows when I need to get a pick-me-up. When I'm feeling a little bit down, I play the right playlist, it pumps me up. When I need time to focus, I go to Spotify. 
Did you hear that? That was the utility of all the songs I want to listen to, but the emotion of how well Spotify knows their subscriber. And so I want you to think about your favorite subscriptions and think about what is the utility that they're offering and what is the emotion it is driving for you. So what I find really funny about subscriptions is that sometimes, think, sometimes folks think that you need to like out innovate, you need the craziest features or like the best content, or you just have to be like out there. And I have to remind people that's not the case. In fact, you could be a leader in subscriptions in a commodity space. Let's look at some subscription services. T-Mobile, they were a distant number four, and now they're number two, and I suspect that one day they may become the number one carrier in the US. They've got incredible retention metrics. Their churn is less than 1% per month. That means that's fewer than one out of 100 is leaving the service every month. Gold standard. But what is their product? You go to the store, you'll see the same Android phones and the same iPhones that you see at another uh, carrier. Or in the US space, if you want to switch your phone number with phone number portability, it's so easy. There's no moat. Yet they built an incredible business. I don't need to talk about Spotify. We've talked about it. But you know, there's a limited ecosystem advantage. It's not like they own an operating system, for example. And the catalog for the music industry, there's very few exclusivities, and so everyone has the same catalog. They built an incredible business. But you know what takes the cake? Costco. That takes the cake. It turns out that the renewal rate for Costco is 93% every year. The average Costco member is a member for longer than a decade. But here's what blows my mind. They've created a retail outlet that you have to spend money to shop at. You need to pay them to shop there. Not only that, they clearly sell commodity goods, right? That's where I buy my Duracell batteries. If you want to get Charmin toilet paper, you've got enough for a year. So not only do they have commodity, but they actually have commodity in inconvenient packaging. Yet, <laughs> yet, look what they've done. They've built an incredible, incredible subscription service. My story number two for you is embracing the subscription trinity. It's a term I coined because there's three levers and they're so intertwined. You've got acquisition, you've got retention, and you've got monetization. And if I pull one of these levers, the other ones are going to change, even if I don't think about it. So when you think about a holistic approach for product management and subscriptions, you want to think about this trinity. And so as a product person, I spend a lot of time looking at roadmaps. And I've asked many folks to share their roadmap on their subscription service. And this is what they share with me. They know acquisition is important. So they're spending a ton of time, maybe 75% of the team's time on acquisition initiatives, how to get people to sign up for their service. They know retention is important, so they've got some time spending on retention. And then monetization, I actually get blank stares sometimes. And so let me define, monetization is who's defining your price? Who's thinking about your tiering strategy? Who's thinking about an upgrade, a downgrade, a cross-sell opportunity? That's monetization. And clearly, many subscription teams are not spending enough time there. So my recommendation for most teams, this is how you want to spend your time. You want to focus on retention. You want to also be thinking about monetization and retention, but also with a, a good healthy dose of acquisition. And so, you know, let me share you some, some data, because I know I've got product managers in the room. They need to be more convinced than just a pie chart. So I'm going to give you a hypothetical subscription service. So let's imagine the subscription service starts the year in January with 1 million subscribers. And what you see is you see five different lines. And these lines represent different monthly churn rates. This is at the rate of which customers are leaving the service. So if you're a gold standard, like T-Mobile, like a Costco even, you're at that 1% line, which is that highest line. And despite becoming an amazing subscription service at 1% monthly churn, by the end of the year, you've already lost 100,000 subscribers. Think about it. You might be the world's best subscription service, but it's like you're fighting gravity. You're always losing customers. 
Now, don't get me started on the next lines. The difference between 1% and 5% sounds similar, but look what impact it makes on churn, right? So basically, if I have 1% churn, I have 900,000 users at the end of the year, but if I have 5% churn, I'm down to you know, under 600,000. And then we see what happens at 10%, and I, what I find amazing is that last red line, 50% churn. You start with a million, you cut it in half, you cut it in half, you cut it in half, guess what? You don't have a business, right? You start with a million, you end up with 488. That's the power of uh, retention. That's why great subscription services measure their churn numbers, not to one decimal place, but to two decimal places on average. So if the data didn't convince you, maybe some academic research will convince you. There's a great study conducted by Bain. This article is available at the Harvard Business Review where the author, author concluded that it costs anywhere from five to 25 times more money to, re, to acquire a new customer than to retain an existing one. So now we have the data, we've got the academic research. And if that still doesn't convince you, let me give you my final, final image. Every subscription service, think of it as a bucket new customers into your bucket, and churn is all those holes. So you might be amazing at acquiring customers, but if they're all churning out because you're not retaining them, you don't have a business. So hopefully I've convinced you how we should be spending time building great subscription businesses. My last story for you is called Exiting Gracefully. And so subscriptions are long-term relationships. As I mentioned, if you build a great subscription service, a customer will be with you for over a decade. Something that's highly contested is what to do about that cancel flow and that cancel button. There's some thinking that actually, if retention is so important, maybe we should hide the cancel flow so people just stay in our subscription, right? So there's actually a bunch of studies. I've done my own experiments on this. And I can say with high confidence that when it comes to exiting, you want to be graceful. You want your customer to be able to exit gracefully. I'm not saying you don't do anything. In fact, this is a feature I worked on at Audible, that if you try to cancel, we try to understand what, what, went, wrong, what went wrong. Uh, did you have a technical issue? And if you did, we'll make sure that you know, we have an agent that helps you. Is this not the right tier or the plan for you? Let's, let's remind you that we have other offers. If it's too expensive, we might give you a special promotion. But at the end of the day, if a user wants to cancel, please let them cancel. If you don't, it's going to cost you dearly. And so I'm going to use cute puppies to explain why you should make it easy to cancel. So it turns out that if you make it hard to cancel, guess what most subscribers do? They call their credit card company. And the credit card company is more than happy to cancel the service on the customer's behalf. And not only do you lose your subscription revenue, you get hit with a chargeback fee which in many cases is actually more than how much money we're charging the customer to begin with. Number two, if you make it easy, customers can self-service, but if they can't, guess what? They're gonna call their customer service team. We know that's gonna cost more money. Word of mouth. How many can recite a horror story of like you're trying to cancel service and it was so painful? It was so painful that you want to think twice about going back to that company again. And when you tell somebody who's thinking about that service, you remind them how difficult it was to cancel when you were a member. And finally, there's a reluctance to join. If you make it hard the first time, customers think twice about coming back. And we said, we're in this for the long game. So maybe the subscription is not good for the customer today, but they might want to come back. So if they have a good experience on their way out, they will think twice when they want to come back versus the other way around. So with that, I'm going to do a quick recap. Number one, being at the intersection of emotion and utility. 
Number two, embracing this holy trinity and acknowledging that acquisition, retention, and monetization are tightly interconnected. And then finally, exiting gracefully, which I'm about to do. Thank you, everyone. Let's stay in touch.